Hello, uh, my name is Charles Burt, and uh, we're bringing you this uh, presentation from the Cal Poly Irrigation Training and Research Center Water Resources Facility. And uh, so uh, I'd like to introduce Kyle Feist. Kyle was together with me. Yep. You want to explain it, Kyle? In, in Sind? Yeah, in Sind province in Pakistan. It's part of the World Bank's uh, partnership with Pakistan and improving their irrigation network. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is try to demonstrate uh, a few concepts of upstream control. But first I want you to take a look and see what we have here in terms of a, uh, a facility. We use this a little bit for research, but mostly for teaching. And what you're looking at right here is uh, a view from the uphill side of our facility. And uh, we have this long four foot um, flume where we can uh, play around with different Oh, different controls, uh, different mechanisms. Uh, you can see there's a return pipe. We have a building down there where we fabricate all our own uh, steel structures. Over here on the right is what we're going to actually be using. Uh, and we have a hodgepodge of all types of equipment. The idea is that we can run a flow rate down the canal and uh, demonstrate uh, different principles, uh, anything from uh, computerized control of canals to very simple things like I'm going to demonstrate today. You can see there's a, a flow control valve at the head of the canal right there. We happen to maintain a constant head on it. You can see right in front of me there's an overflow weir and this is kind of like the idea of a long crested weir but uh, we maintain a constant pressure on the control gate that goes into the canal. So if you look down this little canal you can see that there are a variety of structures. We're going to focus on three of them. We're going to focus on a long crested weir, on a radio gate, which performs the same as a sluice gate uh, for what we're looking at, and then uh, some flashboards. So uh, Kyle and I will go down there. We'll take some measurements. Uh, we'll put things on a whiteboard, and uh, we'll illustrate what's going on. Basically, what we have is a big flow rate right now. Well, it's not big, but it's a high flow rate going down this little canal. And we'll take some measurements of water level. Then we'll come back here and adjust the flow. We'll decrease the flow without changing anything in the canal. Notice we won't change the position on the, of anything on the long crested weir or the flashboards or the radio gate. And we will see what happens. Just checking what's inside a stilling well here. And uh, we have two long crested weirs here actually. You can see one, this is the one facing downstream, the first one. And then the second one faces upstream, which isn't really the best in uh, Pakistan because uh, silt will accumulate on the side. Now, this is almost submerged. It's not quite submerged, but it's almost submerged. This first one, this is the one we're going to look at. It has a gate. Kyle, can you show them the little gate at the end? It has a gate at the end. It, it, this is really simple here. It's just a pull-up gate and uh, that's the type of thing you could use to uh, pull up or put down to uh, remove silt or just leave it closed most of the time or open all the time. So uh, the question here is what will happen to the water level as we change the flow rate, the water level upstream because as you can see here, it's kind of crazy looking, but we do have some kind of a turnout right here. There's a gate and a pipe, but uh, this is, the gate itself is upstream of the long crested weir. Okay, Kyle, can you go over and get the measurement for the... Uh... We're at five CFS right now. Okay, we're at five Q-secs right now. So this is a five Q-sec flow right here. Okay. okay, what we have here is our very first reading. Uh, what Kyle did is he looked in the stilling well just upstream of the long crested weir and he measured 300 millimeters. Now we're going to get a couple of other measurements and uh, don't worry about them being uh, different because we just stuck a, sta a scale in each of the uh, stilling wells and the important thing will be how much the water level changes when we change the flow rate. So don't worry if this one's 300, the next one's 500 or 200. Uh, we're going to be looking at the difference. Okay, Kyle's going to demonstrate a flashboard. What it is, it's just a real simple structure, real cheap. Uh, 
and uh, it's just a single board the width of the channel or so or it's in a structure and the water flows over so this is our second device and it's an overflow device it is a weir the difference between this and the long crested weir is that this is a very short weir the long crested weir is a long weir but other than that it's the same thing water is flowing over the structure now you can see there's a stilling well over there Kyle did you get the reading yet? 420 now you can see that the water is free flow over the flash boards now what I'm gonna do is walk down to the radial gate now this is just a little radial gate that we made for our lab here and it works the same as a sluice gate in terms of hydraulically what happens to the water level uh, it's designed differently as you know radio gates have a hinge point on the back there's a little hinge point so it's a lot easier to move what Kyle's doing is he's trying to bring this water level up to a high level see it's pretty low right now we have a stilling well over here so Kyle is dropping the gate to raise the water level and the reason I'm having you take a look at this him doing that is so that you understand it's not so easy to change the gate now Kyle doesn't have any measurement of the gate opening because the gate opening that he needs well he doesn't know what it is basically the instruction for upstream control is have the water level at a certain depth and the operators know how to do that There's no, we don't use tables or anything like that. I, at least I've never seen people use tables and I've seen thousands of these things. But here's, here's what Kyle has to do. See, he has to be very careful. He, sometimes he lowers it, then he has to raise it a little bit to get it right where he wants it and have it stay. Now here's the difference between this particular canal and let's say the Potho Minor. This particular canal has very short pools if you notice each pool is very short so so it stabilizes quite quickly relatively quickly on something like the Potho Minor if an operator or let's say the West Branch let's say on the West Branch when the operator makes a gate movement it will take a long time it may take a half hour for the canal water to stabilize in front of it and that's very difficult. Now, with a long crested weir, it stabilizes, uh, well, it, it, it just stabilizes by itself. Okay, so we just have some arbitrary height right here that Kyle set it for. And Kyle, what do you have for a, a reading there? Three ninety-five. Three ninety-five. Okay. Okay, now what uh, Kyle did is he just took a reading and then he looked over in the stilling well and um, it's still climbing. Now keep, keep in mind, I'm going to touch this right here, but that's an overflow. We designed this whole thing so that people can play around with the water and uh, if there's a mistake, the water just goes in, goes under those steel plates and back into our reservoir. Now just so you know, I'm going to go up to the previous structure and you'll see it's still free flow now you can see here that the water level downstream of the flashboards rose but it's still free flow in fact you can even see air if you look real closely you can see air under the under the uh, flashboards not that that's that important but you know it's free flow so Kyle has not influenced the water level upstream actually to make a double check Hey Kyle, can you double check this, uh, the water level in the flashboards? Just make sure that I'm not uh, giving you incorrect information. Pardon? 420? Is that the same as it was before? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so what Kyle's done here, if, if he was to raise the water level more, it would create a back pressure on the flashboards and influence the water level upstream of the flashboards but uh, this is not working that way by the way this thing here is just a demonstration of a screen so uh, it's, it's not important for this 
Okay, Kyle, is it stabilized yet? This cap? More or less. 420 now? 420, okay. Okay, now we're gonna do something very simple. You can see this water level's pretty high. And um, uh, what I want Kyle to do is, is go up. Hey, Kyle, can you go up and uh, drop that flow rate to about two and a half CF Q6? So Kyle's heading up there, and he's just gonna go to that gate at the top and uh, we have a couple of ways to measure the flow rate up there but you'll put it at about two and a half q -sex. the exact value doesn't make much difference i just want to show you what happens when you make a change now that that thing is automated so he's just dialing in the number that he wants and uh it's changing it <clears throat> down the road down the road when all these principles are understood when there's a good maintenance program and all that um, you know, that would be the time for uh, automation. You can see we have like a radio signals. That's a look at that antenna. That's a, a low frequency, long distance um, uh, frequency on the radio there. But there are all kinds of gizmos that you can buy. But first, you have to prove success uh, with simple devices. Okay, now this is already stabilized, this water level right here. See, there are no funny waves or anything. Hey Kyle, do you wanna, is it stabilized pretty much? Well, it's averaging, so it's gonna take a couple minutes to get a new flow reading. Yeah. And it might, it might make a small adjustment. It usually makes one or two moves and then it's done. Why don't you just shut it off right now so it, it stabilizes? The, the nature of uh, automation is that um, you hunt around a little bit. In other words, our, with our algorithms, it, it, it uh, zeroes in real fast, but then it, takes a look at the result and then uh, uh, makes a little modification. So I, I just want to stabilize this here. Is it two? Okay, good enough. That's all we need is the number. So two CFS, we drop from five to two. You can see the water is much shallower over the long trusted weir now. If you see that, this whole thing looks entirely different. Okay, Kyle, what do you have? 285. 285. This, by the way, is a, a French design. Uh, we don't see them around very much anymore. It was really a great design at the time. They're, they're quite expensive. Sometimes in countries they try to fabricate their own gate. Uh, usually they don't do it quite right. Um, there's some vandalism problems. But, uh, you know, there are all kinds of options. Okay, we're going to be down here at the uh, flashboards now. Kyle will do the checking on the flashboards. 290. 290, okay. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at where we are on the uh, whiteboard here. So the long crested weir has a 15 millimeter difference. The next one is uh, 130, huh? It's 130, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't ever forget that one. <laughs> okay, and then we'll see what happens with the sluice gate. Now, the, the point is, is that you can have an overflow. In other words, both flash boards and long crested weirs are overflow. But what you see here is a tremendous difference you get with a longer crest, you see. That's the reason that long crested weirs are recommended here. Now, if, if this was an irrigation district and they wanted to keep the water level high with flash boards, they would have to have someone manually go out there and add a board or two. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean here. See, the water level really dropped. So what an operator would do is add one or two boards at a low flow rate. But that means they have to go up and down the canal frequently and make changes. In the meantime, the flow rates out of the turnouts or offtakes are changing. And now here you see uh, quite a problem with the uh, underflow gate. That's why we recommend an overflow instead of an underflow gate. You notice that the water level really, really dropped big time. And uh, now the actual drop depends on what's happening downstream and so on. but. Um, it's uh, 
uh, actually downstream, the water level is kept about the same, if you notice. And that's because the next gate down is an automated gate. But um, this really dropped a lot. Now, so what? here's what you're looking at. Let's see the numbers. It dropped 420 millimeters. Okay, now let me be real clear about what we have. We have exactly the same flow at 5 CFS going through all three structures. Nothing changed. Same with 2 CFS. We had 2 CFS going through all three structures. Each structure was this, had the same channel width, so there was no difference there. Basically, the channel dimensions were the same. The, hopefully, it's obvious what happens here if you look at the difference in control. You see, right now, in Pakistan, for water level control, people are moving gates. Okay, they're not radials, but they're sluice gates. Trying very hard to control the water level, and it's not easy. And uh, they are thinking in terms of flow rate control. And it's a little complicated, but take a look at the change here. What that means is things are changing big time. And it's very difficult for these operators to do what they really need to do. The long crested weir makes it easier. That's why I want a long crested weir in the west branch at the head of the Potho Minor. Because on the west branch, you can have large changes in flow. Look at this is this is more than it's less than half the flow less than half the flow and it look at the difference in the water level control so the idea is to stabilize the water level in front of the potho miner that makes the potho miner very easy to control and um and we know that the water the flow rates down the west branch change we, we saw that from previous graphs Okay, uh, we have a whole variety of things. We have a little man here. It's a electromechanical control. It's, this is a real ancient thing, but there's no computer. It works uh, uh, with um, the water level going up and down on a float, and and there are proximity sensors right here, and then it's a custom-made little unit. This is a real old unit. They're okay for a single gate, but uh, not if you have them in series. The, the reason they're not so great in series is they go bonkers. They, uh, anyway, we use modern control logic. This is a uh, PLC controlled gate right here. It happens to be an overshot gate, but we use PLCs or programmable logic controllers for uh, uh, underflow sluice gates, radio gates, um, you know, just about anything, even pumps we use. A similar logic and um, uh, but you really really have to have superb support and quality and they cost a lot and there's about a 15 percent per year maintenance fee on these types of things and so uh, right now let's stick with the basics this is an ultrasonic unit right here Kyle's gonna just pull it off and uh, it's kind of hard to see but see we have a little insulation on the top and you can see the venting in it and that shoots down and, uh, an ultrasonic signal and measures the depth of the water. It doesn't tell you the flow rate. But the reason for the vents and the, um, the little insulation there is, is you have to keep the uh, ultrasonic device itself uh, fairly cool, or at least the air immediately around it, or it gives you the wrong signal. So let's see. We have another unit here. We're still working on it. Um, but this is... Uh, well, we have an ITRC submerged flap gate, and this is still a work in progress. Right now, um, now nah, that'd take a whole while to talk about that. We, you can see we play with pumps and fittings and filters, and, and uh, here we have a weighing tank, uh, and then over here we have volumetric tanks to measure flow rates real accurately. Um, this is a, a, what's called a Langeman gate. It also has a PLC control. Uh, we write the logic for it, and it moves up and down, it's kind of a special gate. And then you can see here where we play around with flow rates, and we calibrate uh, different types of meters and so on. And over there you can see we have a lot of pumps. We teach quite a bit about pumps, variable fre frequency drives, engines, electricity, so on. 
cutaway filters, pipes. So this is really a, a very nice uh, teaching facility. You can see the, the pieces are large enough that they're not just little toys. But again, if we're going to calibrate something like a flow meter here, what we would do is run the water, the water through a flow meter, be able to adjust the flow rate. The water ends up coming over here through this big vertical pipe going into a weighing tank where we can very accurately weigh you can see it's a tank here the water goes in it we have load cells on the bottom and uh, they're NIST uh, certified load cells and uh, we can uh, measure the uh, change in mass over time and of course that gives us the flow rate